Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. My name is Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and welcome to Ream Library. Uh, one of the more delightful tasks I have as director of the McFarland Center is to coordinate with Professor Alan Avery Peck and a group of other faculty uh, a variety of programs that promote Jewish Christian understanding. Through the really incredible generosity of Jacob and Francis Hyatt, the late Jacob and Francis Hyatt, and their daughter, Myra and Robert Kraft, son, their son-in-law, uh, we've been able to enrich teaching and learning about the Holocaust, about Jewish life, and about Jewish Christian relations at Holy Cross. Kraft Hyatt programming includes lecture series, visiting scholars, opportunities for our faculty and students to study abroad about Jewish life and to attend international conferences at places like Yad Vashem. Tonight we embark on a series of events that aim to deepen our understanding of contemporary anti-Semitism. Ellen Avery Peck, the Kraft Hyatt Professor of Ju Judaic Studies, will offer a student seminar on anti-Semitism in the spring semester. There's a good advertisement, right? Uh, and we'll also host public lectures by Charles Asher Small, director of the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy, and Katja Gibel uh, Mavarek, who explores intersectional identities in her book, Black, Jewish, and Interracial. You can learn more about the Kraft Hyatt program on our website, <coughs> holycross.edu slash McFarland Center, and you can tell your friends later uh, that this talk will be there as well. Tonight I'm really excited, though, to welcome Seth Stevens Davidowitz to Holy Cross. Seth is an economist and former, data, former Google data scientist who uses big data to track the patterns of American searches to try to understand what, what those searches can tell us about ourselves as, and our fellow citizens. What do Americans search for when no one's looking? And what can that tell us about what Americans really think and believe on subjects that they might not be fully honest about in ordinary conversation? or when a uh, pollster comes to ask them a question. His answers sometimes make me laugh. We won't go into some of, the, some of those today. Maybe you will, but, uh, and many other times really uh, make me shiver with a little bit of horror to know what people think. His searches have helped him find out how often, when, and where internet users are looking for hate, how they trigger or are triggered by hate crimes and rhetoric, and the types of users who are more likely to search anti-Semitic, racist, or Islamophobic terms. He's the author of Everybody Lies, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are, which is for sale outside, and he'll be happy to sign some of those for you. Uh, it was a New York Times bestseller, a Wall Street Journal bestseller as well, published this year. He's a contributing op-ed writer for the New York Times, a former visiting lecturer at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, where he developed a course based on his research. He holds a BA in philosophy from Stanford and a PhD in economics from Harvard. So there are seats up front for anyone who wants them. Otherwise, please join us in welcoming Seth Stevens to Thank you. All right, uh, thanks so much, Tom, for that introduction. And thanks, everyone, for having me. And thanks, everyone, for attending. This is a beautiful campus. I've never been here before, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with the, the beauty of, of the institution. Uh, I'm going to talk about something, I guess, less beautiful today, uh, hatred and anti-Semitism and the things we can learn on the Internet about that and about uh, other similar topics as well. So the traditional way to study anti-Semitism is to ask people. Uh, so you put out a survey and you say, how do you feel about Jewish people? And frequently when you ask people in a survey how they feel about Jewish people, they say, we have no problems with Jewish people, uh, whether or not that is, whether that is the truth or isn't the truth. Uh, that's generally the way to understand any parts of the human psyche. For the past 80 years, if you want to know what people want, why they do the things they do, what they're going to do in the future, you conduct a survey. So Gallup or Pew or uh, any of the now tons of organizations we have devoted to this will go out and ask people uh, what they're thinking and what they're doing. And this would work if people are honest to surveys, but over and over again we see that people aren't honest, that people uh, shade the truth, as I put in my book with maybe a little bit hyperbole, everybody lies, and they frequently tell things, tell the pollster, uh, not what they truly believe, but what they think will make them sound good, impress themselves, impress the pollster. Uh, so you see this in many examples where the data doesn't really line up. Uh, my favorite example, maybe a little racy for a 
religious institution, but uh, I'll do it anyway, uh, is sexual behavior. Uh, in the United States, the General Social Survey, the biggest sociological survey in the United States, uh, asks men and women how frequently they have sex, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual sex, and how frequently they use a condom. And you can do the math on that. And uh, according to, if you do the math on women, say they average uh, sex once a week and use a condom 20% of the time, and they're saying they use 1.1 billion condoms every year in heterosexual sexual encounters in the United States, and do the exact same thing for men, and they say they're using 1.6 billion condoms every year in heterosexual sexual encounters. <laughs> and you can kind of see, by definition, those have to be the same, right? There are a, number, a certain number of condoms used every year in heterosexual sexual encounters. Uh, so who's telling the truth, men or women? Uh, neither, according to Nielsen, only 600 million condoms are sold every year. So I think now basically everybody's lying about sex, just men more than women. Uh, and that, that's the, the only source we had before for getting into the human psyche was asking people, but we now have a new source, and that's people's searches online, their Google searches. When they're alone, uh, they have an incentive to tell Google the truth to get the information they need. And it's been shown over and over again that people are very, very honest with Google, that they tell Google things that they might not tell. Uh, to friends, family members, doctors, surveys, and other sources. Uh, I call it digital truth serum because uh, it gets people to kind of pour themselves, uh, pour open their, their, their true thoughts. And uh, so I think the surveys that have dominated sociological and psychological research for the past 80 years are going to be at the least supplemented by the new source, which is Google Trends, which anybody can use. Uh, you can just go to Google Trends and you can see anonymous and aggregate data on what people are searching. And it's a pretty wild data source uh, where people are searching it, when they're searching for it. It's, uh, it's used more and more in academic research, but still, in my opinion, uh, isn't really used enough. And when you go to Google Trends, you find a different view of people than the one you see in maybe surveys or what they tell you. There are more searches for porn than weather, even though if you ask people in surveys, very, very few people admit to watching porn. So uh, very different view of people. And we're seeing over and over again that Google Trends is doing better than surveys uh, in predicting real-world behavior, particularly on these sensitive topics uh, where people might be shading the truth. So one example, predicting who will turn out and vote. If you ask people before an election, uh, are you planning to vote in the upcoming election, uh, just about all Americans say, of course, of course I'm voting in the upcoming election. They want uh, people to think they're exercising their civic duty. Uh, only about 50% of eligible Americans actually do vote in the election. So surveys are kind of useless in predicting who will turn out. But you can predict who will turn out an election, how many people in an area will turn out an election, based on their Google searches in the weeks before election. Are they searching how to vote, where to vote, polling places in unusually high numbers? I think this is one of the reasons uh, that Hillary Clinton uh, did worse than the polls suspected. And the clue was there on Google. I actually wrote a column about this that... Uh, you saw a big drop in searches for how to vote, where to vote, polling places, uh, vote, uh, questions about turnout in places with huge African-American communities in cities that are 80, 90 percent black. And I think this data, my read of the data based on many, many elections, this meant clearly that black turnout was going to be substantially lower than in previous elections, even though the polls were saying were assuming that black turnout was going to be the same as in previous elections. And that's one of the reasons that Hillary Clinton did underperform the polls, because uh, black turnout did drop substantially, and African Americans uh, do tend to lean strongly Democratic. Uh, predicting who is at risk of suicide, I'm working on a column on this right now. Uh, you can predict uh, with high degree of accuracy and much higher than asking people uh, about suicidal ideation. Uh, really, This is really depressing, but you can see when people are making more searches how to commit your suicide, how to kill yourself, suicidal searches that are made in large numbers throughout the United States, when these searches are high in, a, in an area, there uh, tend to be significantly elevated suicides uh, in that area later. And again, this has probably big public health implications. What do we want to do with this information, knowing that many more people in an area are making searches for suicide on Google and likely going to act on it uh, in the coming days or weeks? And then measuring racism. This is how I actually started this research when I was doing my PhD in economics. Uh, I started using internet data to study hatred online. And I started this research, it was 2012, and I don't know if you remember uh, this time period, but there was this idea we lived in a post-racial society. 
uh, Barack Obama had been elected president and uh, you know won by a comfortable margin for and for various reasons people assumed that we had that we had moved beyond hatred and racism in the United States and I in my own naivete and sheltered upbringing kind of believed this so I was shocked when I went to Google and I saw how frequently people were searching for the n-word on Google uh, not the n-word and quote the actual n-word and you know uh, the actual word and I assume they were searching for it in the time period I was looking for as frequently as they're searching for Lakers and Daily Show and Migraine and Economist millions and millions of times, not a fringe search as I would have imagined. And I said, what's going on here? Why are so many Americans, why are so many uh, millions of Americans searching for the N-word? I said, okay, they're looking for rap lyrics. That must be what's going on. Uh, but the version that is frequently used in rap lyrics or almost always uh, used in rap lyrics is the uh, word ending in A rather than the word ending in ER. If you, if you look at the map of the word ending in A, it's a very different map than the word ending in ER. People who are searching for the word ending in ER uh, tend to be looking for jokes, mocking or humiliating African Americans. About 20% of these searches also include the word jokes. Uh, so I was shocked by how frequently Americans are making these searches. I was also shocked by the location of these searches. If you had asked me to map racism against African Americans in the United States, I would have said, okay, deep south, right? South versus north. You think of the Civil War, our country's history, we usually think of racism as, being, as having a north-south divide. And definitely places that are among the highest areas, which is darker red on this map. Also, this is a rate of searches, so it's not like it's because places are bigger. Uh, or using Google more. It's a percent of total Google searches. Uh, places that are higher on this map, uh, definitely uh, among the highest areas are southern Mississippi and southern Louisiana, but then right up there with southern Mississippi and southern Louisiana and parts of South Carolina are upstate New York and western Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio, industrial Michigan. The real divide, I think if you look at this map and had to divide it into two parts of the country, you wouldn't divide it north versus south, it's more an east-west divide where you see it's much lighter as you get to the western part of the country relative to the eastern part of the country. Anyway, I had published this map, and uh, it didn't get too much attention. Uh, it was considered a little, little weird to use Google searches to measure something like hatred. And then, uh, and again, there was this idea we lived in a post-racial society, so I don't think people were ready to scream that all these Americans were secretly racist. Uh, that kind of just wasn't on the agenda. And then uh, in 2016, we had an interesting presidential election, uh, a presidential candidate said some very racially charged things, and people thought, okay, he's about to fall out of the election. Uh, he's, about to, you know, he's about to get killed, and you can't say things like this in the United States. And uh, he didn't. He kept on doing better and better, seemingly the more racially charged things he said. And uh, so, so Nate Cohn, who's a data journalist at the New York Times, uh, he had data on Trump supporting the Republican primary, and he asked me for this data I'd collected on Google searches and he wanted to see if it correlated with Trump's support uh, in the Republican primary. And he found it was the single highest uh, predictor he could find, higher than ideology or economic variables uh, or anything you could think to demographics, anything you think to measure. The biggest predictor of uh, Trump's support in the Republican primary was this racist searches on Google. So I think a lot of the kind of, there, this also racism was really antagonized by Obama. The week where the searches were highest were when Obama was first elected in November 2008. So I think what you saw, and I'm not saying that everyone who supports Trump is racist. There are plenty of people who support Trump for other reasons. But I do think that there was a hidden racism that really was antagonized by Barack Obama. And was, it was secret. It was underground. People weren't talking about it. But it really did uh, help uh, lead Trump to, to victory uh, in, in, the, in, the, in this previous election. So that gets us to anti-Semitism and what we can learn about that. And there are kind of three questions I want to look at which is uh, how anti-Semitism manifests itself, uh, what causes it, and how we might stop it. Uh, big questions, I can't claim I'm going to answer them, but I'll uh, give, try to get some clues. Uh, so what do we learn about Google searches around uh, anti-Semitism? And unlike with African Americans, where the big theme is jokes, 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 uh, you really see with anti-Semitism uh, some really nasty stereotypes that are searched in large numbers. So, uh, if people ask questions about Jewish people, and uh, th these are the top five negative words uh, that people complete the question, are Jews on Google? Are Jews evil, racist, ugly, cheap, and greedy? So you see a lot of uh, really nasty stereotypes about Jews uh, are still out there uh, on the internet, even if people aren't expressing them in polite company. And the other 
way that uh, anti-Semitism manifests itself on the internet, which is really, really disturbing, is with violent thoughts. People type things like kill Jews or Jews must die. Uh, these are not necessarily the most sane members of society. They sometimes make these searches at 3 a.m. They're a strange search to make. What's Google going to tell you if you tell, you know, type kill Jews? Uh, but even though they're weird, they're not the most uh, normal search. It's not really clear why people are searching for them. They do have predictive information that you do see when these searches are higher. Hate crimes against Jews also are higher. So when more people at 3 a.m. are making searches like kill Jews or Jews are evil or any of these nasty, nasty searches, you're going to see more attacks against Jewish Americans. Actually, hate crimes against Jews, the number one victim of hate crimes in the United States now, which also surprised me, I didn't know this before I did this research, is uh, Jews. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, the other way that uh, anti-Semitism manifests itself on the internet is on hate sites. Uh, one of them is called Stormfront. How many people have heard of the site Stormfront? Okay, so a few people. It's been in the news a little bit recently. It wasn't... Uh, I actually had never heard of the site. I was just with dinner with some people here, and uh, I was telling this story, how I started this research. I had written a column uh, in the New York Times, and I was... People make embarrassing Google searches, right? So one of the embarrassing Google searches I tend to make is for my own name. And I was searching my own name, and I uh, found that Stormfront was discussing my work, and I got really excited. I'm like, oh, this site I've never heard of is like I'm, I'm famous in the media. I'm like this media personality. I was really excited about the, about about uh, uh, that that uh, you know people were interested in my work, and I go to this site, and it's like another Jew in the media. I'm just like, what the heck? Like I didn't I didn't know what's going on, and uh, and then so then I kind of became obsessed with this site just because I had never heard of it, and, and kind of who was on this, and I found out that it was. Uh, the most popular hate site on the internet, about 300,000 unique views every, uh, every month in the United States, uh, which is kind of a huge number, uh, biggest hate site on the internet. And I said, I'm going to study this, this site. I'm basically going to download all the profiles on this site and see uh, what we can learn about the people who join this, uh, this site. And uh, the first thing I learned, which it wasn't a coincidence that they were picking on me, is that Jews are the biggest target on Stormfront. About 39% of members uh, mention Jews in their profile relative to 33% for uh, blacks, and you see lower numbers for uh, other groups. Again, this stunned me. I would not have believed that the number one hate site in the United States would get 300,000 unique visitors and would focus mostly on Jews. Like That just was not uh, something I would have ever imagined. I, I was not, I'm not living in the United States. I thought I was living in. Uh, I found that out. Uh, all right, so what about the age of the users? Again, surprised me, uh, young, young, young. Uh, it doesn't surprise me as much now because if you look at some of the, cake, the, some of the recent attacks in Charlottesville, there's been a very young group of people that have focused on Jews and been attacking, things, attacking uh, people. But when I, when I first did this research, I couldn't believe that uh, how young this, this crowd screwed, where uh, eight, uh, you see the most common age group is 18 to 29, followed by 14 to 17. Uh, so uh, really uh, targeting and appealing to younger members of society uh, in much bigger numbers. All right, so where are these members? And you can see this is a map I, I, I downloaded per capita uh, where uh, there are more Stormfront members. And you can see orange is higher and purple is lower, so the most involvement is Montana. And uh, lowest is, I guess, D.C., and... What can we say about these areas? Uh, what do they have in common? I think the main thing I could point to about these areas that are high in Stormfront members is there's a place I've never been. Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, that's kind of not a coincidence. It seems like there are not many Jewish people uh, in these places with a lot of Stormfront members. Uh, and that's, so there are kind of two reasons this might be. Is it because, so, and that is clear that there are far fewer Stormfront members in uh, places with high Jewish populations. There are two reasons for this. It could be that Stormfront members who grew up around Jewish people, if you grow up and go to high school in uh, New York or California or Florida or D.C. and you don't like Jewish people, you may move to Idaho or Montana or places where you can avoid Jewish people. And the other explanation is that uh, just maybe uh, less exposure to Jewish people is, is causing this. And I think uh, one way to test this is we can look just at high school students, so just people under the age of of, uh, I guess, the younger members of, of Stormfront, people who still be in high school where they don't really get to choose where they live, they haven't moved to a place. And you see, even among this mem uh, this group, <coughs> <coughs> they, uh, 
there are more Stormfront members uh, in places with fewer Jewish people. So it does seem that this is a, a cohort that uh, that this is uh, that they're that expo uh, not having exposure to Jewish people does uh, is associated with a more higher likelihood of uh, joining Stormfront. All right. So again, uh, what else can we learn about them? We can look at their le education levels, their income levels. We don't know for sure, but kind of comparing them to zip code levels, or sometimes they have individual level data from Facebook, which I also analyzed. And you see uh, high levels of education. It's a smart group of people. This shocked me too. I'm like, these people are not idiots. Like even just go to Stormfront, you're just like, okay, these people are evil. They're not idiots. Uh, and the, they, the, they report their, activ their favorite activities. The number one most uh, reported favorite activity of Stormfront members is reading. And you totally see that in the post. People are talking about uh, political theory or Darwin or Nietzsche or you know, philosophy. A very, very smart, educated, really high IQ group of people uh, on the Stormfront website, which is pretty surprising. Uh, relatively high income. Uh, membership does not rise when unemployment rises. So the, think, think of the Great Recession, all these people out of work. Uh, there was no rise in Stormfront members, membership in areas that were particularly hard hit for the, from the Great Recession. That doesn't seem to be a huge factor. Uh, economic struggles. Uh, many are single. This was actually something that you see reported over and over again when people join the site. Complaints about competition in the dating market. Some Jew, some somebody, some maybe African American person, uh, gets a gets their the, a, a woman they want to date, and then they get furious and start looking joining these sites and finding that Jews are running the world and lead and you know uh, pushing African Americans to the front and taking all their women and doing things like that. So I think really uh, more. C complaints about competition in the dating market than competition in the economic market, uh, and it's, uh, which, is, which, which is pretty interesting. Again, grew up in areas with few Jews. It's, strikingly, uh, it's striking the differences, these two types of hate that I've studied on the internet, anti-black hate and anti-Semitism, just in some ways night and day how they manifest itself on the internet in the United States today. Uh, on all different dimensions, they're very, very different. So location, we said that anti-Semitism is places with few Jews. Uh, this isn't true of, of, of uh, anti-black racism, which tends to be highest in places that are about 20%, 15% black, uh, so, uh, and, and, and lowest in places that are you know, 0 to 1% black. Uh, so uh, very, very different. It, it, it's, it's probably a different experience, uh, experiencing racism if you're black and you're experiencing anti-Semitism if you're Jewish. One of the reasons I probably was shocked by anti-Semitism as a Jew is just I don't, I really literally, even that, seeing this data, I, I'm, not, uh, associate, I'm not seeing these people very frequently. Uh, I didn't grow up about people, like these people aren't uh, in my circles, they're living in Montana and Idaho, a different place where I don't see. Whereas an African American, uh, the places where racism is highest are places where many, many African Americans live. So very, very different experience. Uh, age, if you look at the uh, demographics of the racist searches I was showing you earlier, the jokes mocking, humiliating African Americans, uh, older places with big populations, 65 plus, whereas we saw with anti-Semitism, these hate sites, they're appealing to people under the age of 30, really, really different. Also kind of scary if you're Jewish uh, that it has such a young membership because it's not going to die out anytime soon. Education, racism, very, very low. The areas where racism is highest, education levels are very, very low. Uh, most people don't have a college education. Very, very few people have PhDs. Uh, Anti-Semitism appeals, as, as we mentioned, uh, to people with higher levels of education. Uh, political views, uh, despite there's kind of this idea that racism uh, against blacks is a Republican Party phenomenon. That's not true. If you look at uh, areas that have those that, that are higher red in that map I showed you, it's not correlated at all with the political ideology of the place. It's just as high in places with lots of Democrats as places with lots of Republicans. It's pretty much a moderate phenomenon, although a blue collar one. Whereas anti-Semitism in the United States is very, very right-wing phenomenon, uh, places like Montana and Idaho. Uh, the stereotype of the groups are very different. Uh, but the, if, if I just described how anti-black uh, race in the United States manifests itself, it portrays uh, African Americans in really a pathetic light with these jokes mocking them and saying how kind of stupid they are. Uh, in Anti-Semitism, very, very different. Jews come across, are portrayed as clever and all-powerful, but just greedy and cheap and evil, so very, very different uh, portrayals of the groups. And then, the ma I think, related to that, uh, you see the way it manifests itself. Uh, if you understand, if you're kind of mocking a pathetic group, 
uh, a group that you think is pathetic, obviously they're not, is uh, you make jokes mocking them. Whereas uh, with Jewish, with anti-Semitism, it's uh, conspiracy theories. It's that Jews are running the show and there are groups of people kind of joining on the internet uh, to kind of discuss how they're gonna deal with uh, this supposed uh, super powerful, super clever, super greedy, super evil group. Uh, all right, a typical member, I would say, is maybe some a, a, a man, male, more males than females, uh, of Stormfront is a, a typical member of Stormfront is a male in maybe his early 20s who uh, on paper has a pretty decent life. He has a job. Uh, he has a good education, uh, but he's not maybe at the top of the ladder, and he maybe isn't the best at getting women uh, and uh, is single and kind of complaining about his life and unhappy about how his life is going and looking for an excuse or someone to blame about uh, for, for his supposed problems uh, and finds kind of anti-Semitism. You see a lot of people on Stormfront, how they describe they got to the site. It's, they, they like, sometimes it's a, someone dated, uh, it was a dating incident, but sometimes they find some guy, some older guy who kind of tells them about this issue that they didn't even know about. They hadn't even heard about this. I, you know, they didn't grow up around a lot of Jewish people. They didn't really have this idea that uh, this conspiracy that the Jews were running the world, but uh, once they hear it, they get drawn to it and get kind of addicted to Stormfront, and it becomes kind of the predominant uh, fact, the predominant activity in their life is uh, going around Stormfront and, and uh, complaining with like-minded people about how Jews are creating all the problems in society. And I think that's a dangerous situation, unfortunately, because it doesn't suggest maybe an, such an obvious solution. Uh, if the problem were jobs or unemployment, we could say, okay, well, we got to put people to, back to work. Uh, we can't have great recessions. We can't have uh, economic troubles. But there are always going to be men who are not at the very, very top of the dating market or the top of the ladder. A ladder only has certain steps. And I think uh, if some of these men are kind of inherently drawn to this uh, conspiracy theory, that is, uh, a, 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 it's, it's not, there's not necessarily an obvious solution to it. And the other thing that you do see is that anti-Semitism uh, has been rising. A lot of the searches that I showed uh, you were about the highest they've ever been in the previous months. Searches for Jews are evil and Jews are greedy uh, and, and some of these other searches. I think one of the things that seem to play a role is just the news coverage uh, of the issue. So if you, when Steve Bannon uh, was in power, uh, there was a lot of attention paid to uh, him and also his supposed connections to potentially white nationalism. White nationalism was talked about for really the first time uh, in the mainstream media. And, uh, and there was the attack in Charlottesville. And you actually see, it's kind of disturbing, you see people making searches. These are searches that are made in Montana and Idaho. Uh, searches are made for Steve Bannon, and then people search for white nationalism. And then people say, oh, people say Steve Bannon, oh, he's connected. They see he's connected to white nationalism. They see that. They search for white nationalism. They see Stormfront comes up. They go to Stormfront. And then pretty soon they're searching Jews are evil. Why are Jews evil? And I think those are people who really, there's almost a vacuum in their lives. That's kind of the, uh, the guy in his 20s who has a pretty good life on paper, but is really, really unhappy and single. And uh, maybe has never even thought of the idea that, uh, this conspiracy, some some of these conspiracy theories that you can find on Stormfront, and again, it's pretty disturbing that just by basically presenting the information to people, uh, just putting the ideas in their head of white nationalism through Steve Bannon, who wasn't necessarily a white nationalist but was connected to white nationalism in the media, uh, you can actually create this idea in people very very quickly. So it's it's uh, that is, that is scary. And well, what can we do to kind of stop hatred? And I'm now going to switch. Uh, to a study I did on Islamophobia in the United States. And Islamophobia also manifests itself on the internet with very, very nasty searches about Muslims. Searches like, kill Muslims, I hate Muslims, Muslims are evil, no Syrian refugees. Uh, really, really nasty, nasty searches about Muslim Americans, Muslims are terrorists, Muslims are evil. And these searches tend to respond very predictably uh, to terrorist attacks. I'm sure there was a rise. I haven't actually checked uh, after the recent New York City terrorist attack and these types of searches, anti-Muslim searches. Uh, but pretty much any time Muslim Americans are in the news for having committed a terrorist attack, there's an explosion of really, really nasty searches on Google about uh, Muslims. And uh, this actually happened, the, probably the, the biggest rise uh, in the history of Google search data for these types of searches about Muslim Americans 
was in December 2015, if you guys remember the San Bernardino attack, when two Muslim Americans shot up a, a, group, a party uh, in San Bernardino, killed, I think, 14 people. You see, right after this attack, there were all these really, really nasty searches about Muslim Americans. And uh, the top search with the word Muslims uh, in it immediately after the attack, literally minutes after the attack, was kill Muslims. And these are like kind of, I think, really enraged, uh, angry people. So uh, uh, after the San Bernardino attack, a few days after the San Bernardino attack, uh, Barack Obama kind of realized that there was a problem in the United States uh, with Islamophobia and that he wanted to do something about it. He wanted to basically address the nation and try to get people to uh, try to calm people down and to kind of lower this hatred that was uh, overtaking America in the wake of the San Bernardino attack. And he gave a speech, it was on national TV, it got a lot of attention, uh, where he talked, about, uh, he talked about Islamophobia and uh, what we, the responsibility we have as Americans to not give in to this. To basically, uh, it's our responsibility as Americans to not uh, up, 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 appeal to, to uh, appeal to freedom, not fear, to reject discrimination, to not judge people based on their religion if they want to uh, enter this country. And it was, I thought, a great speech. I mean, I, I'm kind of a, a full disclosure, I'm a pretty big Obama supporter, but I wasn't the only one who thought that this was a good speech. Uh, Think Progress, The New York Times, uh, Boston Globe, Newsweek, all the serious outlets said that Obama's speech uh, was, a, was very successful and kind of did the job of explaining, you know, both talking about the risk of terrorism, but kind of explaining to Americans uh, why they shouldn't give in to this uh, instinct to hate another group of people. And so I wanted to see, uh, can, I, Google search data is pretty remarkable. You can break it down minute by minute. I wanted to see during and after Obama's speech what happened to these angry searches uh, that Americans had been making with such great frequency uh, when Obama gave this speech that got such good reviews. Uh, so what happened to all these searches? Did they drop? And I looked at the data and I found that these nasty searches about Muslim Americans didn't drop. They didn't even stay the same. They went way up during and after his speech. So it seemed like everything Obama was saying, the responsibility that Americans have to uh, uh, get not, not give in to uh, fear and appeal to freedom, the responsibility we have to reject discrimination, everything he was doing while it sounded great and got great reviews was actually backfiring for its main purpose, which was calming down uh, these people who were so angry uh, at, at Muslims. So that's pretty pessimistic, as is much of this talk, but uh, that's, that's not actually uh, the only thing I found in the speech. Uh, the other thing uh, we found, I actually worked on this with this, uh, a co colleague, Evan Soltas, is Evan and I found that there was one line at the end of the speech uh, that Obama gave that we thought was maybe a little bit more interesting and had a little more interesting in effect, where Obama said that Muslim Americans are friends and neighbors. Uh, they are sports heroes, and yes, they're the men and women who will die, are willing to die in defense of our country. And after Obama gave this line, there was a huge rise in searches for Muslim athletes followed by Muslim soldiers. In fact, for the first time in many, many years, uh, the top descriptor of Muslim American of Muslims on on Google was not Muslim terrorists or Muslim extremists. It was Muslim athletes, followed by Muslim soldiers, and they kept, these two kept the top spot for weeks afterwards. And you see around the internet, uh, young boys and young men saying, "I didn't know Shaquille, Shaquille O'Neal's a Muslim. Is that true? I didn't know that." And uh, Muhammad Ali's a Muslim. So uh, we kind of suggested that maybe there are two approaches to dealing with trying to calm an angry mob, uh, one of which is less effective and one of which is more effective. If you look at most of the lines in the speech uh, that, that got such great reviews, they're kind of lecturing people. They use the word responsibility or should. They're telling people things they've uh, heard a thousand times, and uh, that didn't seem to work. Uh, but if you look at the last line that had a different effect, that's really provoking people's curiosity, giving them new information, changing the way they... Uh, view the group that's causing them so much rage. So we published this as a New York Times column, and I don't think it's crazy when you write a New York Times column that powerful people see it, and maybe even people in Obama's staff had read our article, 
because a couple weeks later, he gave another speech about Islamophobia, which he knew was not getting any better. Uh, this time it was in a Baltimore mosque. Again, it was on national TV. Again, it got a lot of attention. Uh, but the content of the speech was basically totally different. There was no talk of responsibility and the things we should do. You know, gone was the sermon or the lecture or uh, telling things, people things they've heard a thousand times. And, but he really doubled or tripled down on the curiosity strategy. So he said that Muslim Americans are athletes and armed service members, as he did in the previous speech. But he also said that Muslim Americans are police officers and firefighters, teachers and doctors. Uh, slaves from Africa are Muslim. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams had a copy of the Quran. Uh, Muslim American built the skyscraper in Chicago. Just all kinds of facts about Muslim Americans, each of which kind of maybe would be surprising to a lot of people, would not be how they traditionally have thought of Muslims' role in, you know, in American history. Uh, so again, I looked at the search data in the uh, minutes and hours following this speech and what happened to the nasty search about Muslim Americans, kill Muslims, I hate Muslims, during and after this speech. Well, this time they actually dropped. So uh, I'm not saying that uh, we've cured hatred in the world through my two little studies. Uh, and obviously this, this has to be replicated a, a bunch of times and more, you know, if we ever get a president who actually wants to lower hate well, and wants to experiment, he could, uh, he could use the, some of this analysis and try to test this further and we can analyze it more. And, uh, you know, maybe people are going to bring people into their labs and discuss, and discuss this. So. Uh, definitely, this is just the beginning, not the the uh, end of the story on hatred. But what I really, uh, what I find very exciting about this is not necessarily the particular findings, which you know, two speeches. I don't know that uh, you know you want to be careful, uh, you know, saying you you know you found great lessons from two speeches. The third speech you get, you find something totally different. You want to be careful, but I think it is really uh, shows the power of this data and the power of big data and the power of Google searches, where you have. You know, I think these people are maniacs. That's not a very academic term, but you have a lot of angry, angry people uh, making these nasty searches, and you have their data minute by minute. They're kind of expressing what's enraging them and what isn't enraging them. And you can see, you can really compare that to outside events like the speech of a president, and it's turning something as seemingly as chaotic as how do we calm an angry mob into a real science, I think. And you're going to be seeing more and more of that. Uh, these areas that have been kind of where we haven't really known what's going on or we've just been appealing to our intuition, uh, we're going to get real, uh, more profound, I think, real, uh, real findings on these topics. Uh, so obviously more work to be done on all these areas, uh, but kind of how do we stop anti-Semitism? Again, I don't, I don't claim that I, that I have the answers, but kind of based on my research from kind of where anti-Semites live and these studies I've done on what lowers hate, uh, you know, you kind of have these, this vacuum of people who grow up uh, uh, without really seeing Jewish people, and they hit their 20s and they don't like their lives, and they're uh, ready to be, uh, to, for this vacuum to be filled with this idea that Jews are creating all their problems and then become obsessed with it, and that becomes the key theme of their adult life. And I think, uh, you know, if we can fill, fill that void earlier with uh, kind of provoking their curiosity, kind of giving them different images of Jewish Americans, uh, who, who, who wouldn't fit into this, uh, you know, this stereotype, or uh, w you know, would would make them think more highly of Jewish people uh, before they kind of are, before they're uh, exposed to the nasty stereotypes you see on and cherry pick stereotypes you see on Stormfront. I think that could potentially uh, be very, very useful. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much all I have. But uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, so anti-Semitism versus anti-Israel uh, attitudes. I haven't done too much about that. That that is a question I get asked a lot. Also, you know, on college campuses, there's a left-wing movement that you know I kind of have this. I've kind of focused on this right-wing violent uh, conspiracy anti-Semitism, and there's also kind of a left-wing movement that can uh, many people think uh, move into anti-Semitic. Uh, realms, which I haven't really done too much research on. I, I, it's another area that you could potentially use some of this data uh, to find exactly what's going on there. But uh, you know, I, I, I haven't done. There, there's, a, there's a lot more more to be done on all these topics, which is I was explaining on the again on, on this dinner I had uh, with some of the Holy Cross students and faculty how you know th this being kind of a search data expert is perfect for my personality, where I get obsessed with things for about two months and then I move on to something else. Uh, but for people who have a more uh, less of that personality and more like like digging into things and 
and devoting their uh, careers and lives to one topic. I think this is great, a great resource that, you know, we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg. You know, scratch, I'm mixing metaphors, all kinds of metaphors there. <laughs> scratching, the, scratching the surface, on whatever. Okay, but uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I think you're definitely going to see more, you know, definitely those, that's the type of thing you can explore and, and how much of, of, of the, uh, you know, I guess the boycott uh, Israel stuff is is connected to anti-Semitism. I think you would be able to learn that, some of that with this uh, with this data. I haven't really done it. Great point. The question is: uh, Has is, is there an association between distance from the Holocaust and anti-Semitism? You know, if, if you kind of uh, if you kind of do the demographics of younger people who aren't around a lot of Jewish people, they might not know as much about the Holocaust. And I, I haven't I haven't studied. I know on Stormfront they call the Holocaust the Holo hoax, which uh, you know makes my blood boil as a grandson of survivors. But uh, I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I don't know. It's another area. Again, like I'm, uh, I, I, fre frequently when people said, have you looked at, my answer is no. But I, I think that's a good answer because like, I hope, you know, it's like people, if you buy my book afterwards, people, you know, there's a lot more in this book, but there's also so much more that people email me like, hey, did you look at this? I'm like, no, that's a great idea. You should look at it. Like, uh, it's you know there there is so much more from the internet, uh, you know the, the idea that first of all just the idea that you could study a hate group like Stormfront, like our there used to be people would infiltrate uh, KKK meetings to try to learn anything they could, but now the data on Stormfront like all the posts every all the visits every all the members that's all just in the digital exhaust that's all it's, it's a, a program you write a program you scrape that you have all that data of the biggest hate site in the world. That's where most people, I don't think people are having secret meetings anymore. They're all just going to Stormfront and that data now is available for uh, researchers uh, to mine. So, yeah, so the visitors versus members on Stormfront. You want to be a little clear, ca uh, cautious. So there's always this issue on Google, on, on Google searches or visits that there are some people who are there just for curiosity. Uh, who you, I, I think in general that phenomenon is uh, that concern is overblown. Uh, that there are some people. I, I searched a, a lot of racist things when I was writing my book. You know, I'm in some of these data sets. I'm peanuts uh, compared to you know the areas that really have a lot of racists. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I, I with the with the visitors, uh, that data just isn't available to me. Uh, you know, it would be available to the Stormfront people, but I don't think they're they're not big fans of people like me. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I'm not too too uh, you know. Uh, I don't. I don't think I'll gain that data, but I, I don't know. Uh, but you, you can see the the posters though, uh, as well, and th those also skew very young. The people who post on on the site. So, uh, and and you definitely saw it in the Charlottesville. I think that was kind of stunning. The same kind of reaction I had when I first did this data, and I'm like, wait, there are all these young young men who hate Jews. I think was something that maybe people saw when they saw the videos out of Charlottesville, where it was a similar uh, demographic, uh, also very young. And I think not stupid, although very, very evil. Uh, not like obviously, you know, uneducated or what? what? Yeah, I don't. What, why is it reborn? I think I, I hadn't heard of the distance from the Holocaust idea, but uh, you know, it's definitely uh, it's definitely interesting. Uh, you know, I think you know there, there's probably a limit to how low these types of things can ever get because they're always going to be, again, some people are unhappy with their lives and this is kind of like the perfect conspiracy theory for someone if you're unhappy with your life uh, to blame another group of people that have a lot of, seem to have a lot of power. Uh, so uh, I don't totally know. Again, like, you know, th there do seem to be more, I guess, unhappy younger men, maybe. I've, I've heard, you know, there are drug problems. There are a lot of, although that doesn't seem to be this demographic, but uh, it could be that you know, the, I think uh, there there are, is a crisis among young men of kind of what they're doing with their lives and kind of the traditional jobs that gave them meaning, where they're working with their hands and very physical, are kind of gone. And uh, so it's a you know even if you look at kind of the Charlottesville protest, kind of the physicality of that protest, the uh, the need for violence or the need to uh, express oneself physically, I wonder if that's related at all. It could be, uh, you know. Uh, so I think anything that's bad for for young men maybe would be bad for for this. Though it's not as simple as just not having jobs again, because it wasn't just the recession that hit them. It's it's more complicated than that. But uh, kind of a dissatisfaction uh, that young men feel with their lives, I think, 
uh, that that's a dangerous uh, that's that's a dangerous situation. Yeah, so I think on this particular one, it's pretty tough. So the question is, can, you know, what do polls tell us about anti-Semitism? So a lot of like extreme anti-Semitism that would express itself here, like uh, you know, I hate hate Jewish people, or Jews are evil, or Jews should die, or the Holocaust was fake. Like you're gonna get such small numbers, and among the pe the ones who do answer yes, they're gonna be just messing with the survey. So it's really really hard uh, to really get too much meaningful information. Uh, but I, I haven't I haven't done. Pro I probably should do more on the actual, what the surveys tell us on uh, some of these some of these issues. Yeah, I think I think it's gonna be really tough because it, it is uh, again I think you run into the problem again. There's a small percentage of people that love messing with surveys, particularly younger people. Uh, that no matter what, like no matter what, they'll they'll think put an answer that they think is humorous, or, or uh, and and you combine that with the fact that the sensitivity of the issue, you can get some really wacky answers uh, that are hard to interpret on a topic like this. No, so it's uh it's the percent of it's the percent of total Google searches. So it's not it's not either that the population is smaller or that they use Google less. Uh, so, so if you do these maps for like other things, Montana will be right at the top. It's not, yeah, it's not biased by either population or uh, the propensity to use Google. I think it's actually it's actually interesting. I think so. It, it definitely skews male, but it's not ninety ten. It's not. It's 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 it's. I think about seventy five twenty five. I'd have to look at the data again, but uh, seventy five twenty five male. I think uh, you know, women may be less likely to want to be seen in public uh, holding these views. Uh, again, the dating comes into play a lot. I think some people view this as a dating site. Uh, you see that you do see that a little bit. So, uh, well, it makes. I mean, it makes sense. You should like if you hold these. Although, kind of actually, one of the disturbing things is that uh, again, it goes to like that these people are are smarter than I would have guessed, and they're also like they there are like uh, four there are like uh, threads on. Uh, Stormfront that just like discuss Breaking Bad and what a great show it is and analyze the episode and like it could be the the conversation I have with my friends after a Breaking Bad episode like it's like at that level I'm like like wait what's going on here and then they'll have like a uh, they'll just be like analyzing a dating site like uh, OK Cupid or I'm like I'm like wait these people are on OK Cupid like I've been on that site like <laughs> it's like it's a little weird to be like. Oh, the white nationalist. You could be you could be dealing with a white nationalist. I mean, probably less in those places I've lived, as you can see from the data, where it's you know that might be probably more a risk if you're in uh, Montana. But uh, yeah, they're not. I mean, I guess it makes sense. Like, I kind of just imagine that like white nationalists would be like in just a total other universe, but like they still are using the same products, like watching the same things, using the same websites. And actually, one of the interesting things in this data set, which goes to the point that these people are not uneducated. Is they're actually uh, twice as li they're twice as likely to read the New York Times as like a typical internet user, which again is just not like yeah it's like they're they're political junkies like you see like they it comes across just forget like the data analysis and how frequently they go to these sites or they purport reading like you go to the site they're like okay these guys these people are like they're not idiots they're evil <laughs> like that's that's the kind of I think comes uh, is very clear. Whereas if you go to some of like the joke sites mocking African Americans, you're just like these guys are idiots. <laughs> like it's very different. It's like you know low, very low levels of education, very like you know crude uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just striking, the, just how much dating comes up on these sites. Like it's just interesting. Like more again, like we usually think economics, economics, economics. I think as social scientists, you know, as uh, yeah, it's like sex, sex, sex is more. <laughs> Is like usually, you know, I'm an economist. So like when I think of like what people need in their life, it's like where they need jobs, they need a stable income, and it's like you go to this site, it's like, yeah, it's like yeah, it's sex, yeah. So, uh, well, in any, I don't think any of this talk should think, make anybody think I'm optimistic about anything. So, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I think uh, initially, if, when I when I was doing this, I wasn't even thinking in those terms. Like, and nobody else, as far as I could tell. Like when I, when I was writing this stuff was like, oh, like this is potentially nefarious uses or stuff. Uh, and now I do get that question in pretty much every talk I give. Not to say you're not unique, but like, uh, it's it it is kind of something on people's minds. And I, you know, yeah, I guess like you could say that 
I think big data isn't good or bad, it's just powerful. And you know, I'd like to think that there are more good people out there than bad people out there. And you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, not many people are gonna wanna like a rise in Islamophobia or a rise in anti-Semitism, but you know, you don't, you don't, you never know for sure. And I think the Cambridge Analytic thing was is a little bit overblown. Uh, you know, I think uh, once you, the, for people who don't know, they're the company that worked with they were, they were Trump's data team, and there's kind of this idea that they were uh, figuring out everyone's psychological profile and like manipulating them uh, like rats to support Trump and. Uh, I think after you win an election, it's very, very easy to like say you were geniuses and doing all these advanced things, and then you get all these corporate corporations interested in what you were doing. When, whereas I think what they were doing was pretty basic. Uh, the big, powerful. I think Hillary Clinton did some really uh, dumb things. She didn't have like a, a real Facebook ad operation. Just simply having ads on Facebook are much more powerful than ads on other places because you can target them to small groups of people and you can test them. Uh, and that, that was, I think, where Cambridge Analytica got its big returns. The psychographic profiling and stuff, uh, I think, is not, was not nearly as important as they're claiming. Yeah, so, yeah, so the question is, like, how should we think that it's not like every, you know, every group is oppressed in the same way? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, Stormfront does talk about other groups besides Jews, as I put in the initial slide. So it's not, Jews are the predominant group, but they're unhappy with lots of other groups. Uh, yeah, I think I think every group probably does have its unique approach, and you know I think uh, I think if you look at like the gay rights movement, this is just me pontificating, but I think one of the reasons it moved so fast is because once some people came once some people came out, then a lot of people had relatives who were gay, or friends or close friends or close relatives who were gay, and then uh, they kind of wanted their friends and relatives treated fairly, and then it kind of, and that kind of got a, vis a virtuous cycle going. And that's not really something you do for like Judaism or, uh, or Afri or you know, for Black people. That's not like, you know, it wouldn't work the same way. So I think there are really, there are probably in many areas probably a unique. May there may be some unique approaches. You know, the curiosity thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I w wouldn't find it surprising if that's fairly universal. That always kind of positive images of a of a group, particularly surprising ones, are going to be pretty helpful, uh, you know, across all the different, all the different groups. But, uh, you know, there definitely might be some, uh, some approaches that are, uh, some approaches that are better for one group and some approaches that are better for other groups, uh, considering the different uh, nature of the, the oppression. Yeah, sure.